ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Mary Staben and Hi. Christina Wayborn. <laughs> Great. How long? How did you get? What did you get to? The back hands. The back hands. You just crushed the dice. What? Crushed the dice. The guy crushed the dice. Oh, oh okay. Kabir. Yeah. Kabir yeah. <laughs> <Kabir> Betty. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the baddie guy. And out of curiosity, what were the dice made of? They weren't real dice. Paper. Paper? Yeah. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, Mary knows everything. <laughs> I can pretend I do. That was like, four, what, 40 years ago? 40, exactly. Okay. So it's an anniversary this year. Uh, yes. Awesome. I just came back, uh, and in June uh, we had a um, reunion at the Nimi train station where all the uh, train sequences were shot. And um, we got to meet all the people that we'd worked with there 40 years ago. And it was the most loving, the greatest, wonderfulest time. We, we just had a great time. And some of the Bond girls came, and um, uh, I hadn't gotten a chance to know them very well during filming because we were so busy. But uh, this time, we had plenty of time to get to know each other, and it was just uh, terrific. So, And John Glenn was there, the director. He's uh, 91 now, I think. Yeah. He's uh, yeah, he getting up there, 90. but he's in good shape, and so it was really a great memory. It was supposed to be East Germany, the Peterborough train. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And we were there for quite a while. Yeah. Several days, anyway. It was cold while we were shooting. Yeah, freezing. Yeah. So is there like a tight-knit group where all the Bond girls get together, like reunions besides conventions? Are there other type of reunions? I'm friends with a lot of them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and we're friends with Maud. Maud is Maud another Swedish yeah. Bond girl. So we were the three Swedes on the set. Yeah. And We could talk about the men behind their back and they didn't know what we were saying. Uh. <laughs> And Roger Moore used to go and get us hot coffee at Pinewood Studios because it was so cold. And we were pretending that it was in India, you know. So it was like, yeah. we were in these skimpy little clothing, but... And it was freezing. Ice, ice tips, like yeah. hanging. Yeah. And we, that, that was on that stage that they built the bedroom where I steal the egg from uh, Roger. So you can imagine, even though it was built up in the stage, they couldn't heat it. So we had ski pants underneath the sheets. We were so cold. <laughs> it was crazy. But that stage is it burnt down, so it's no longer there. It was one of the biggest sound stages in the world, I think. Oh yeah, it burned down. Yeah, and that's where we did all the yeah. fight sequence where I kick the, uh, you know, rifle out of that guy's hands, and yeah, we did a lot of work there. I yeah, I understand you broke some toes. Yeah, in fact, now I have arthritis there, and it really pisses yeah. me off. <laughs> <laughs> but I keep limping along. So it was, it was, was explain the stunt that caused, so they, when, we, I don't think we got to the scene in the movie, so. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know. what happened was, um, uh, the, the fellow uh, that was, uh, I su I'm supposed to kick butt with, he uh, uh, had this bazooka, and in the scene where I'm supposed to kick it out of his hands, we were supposed to put a uh, plastic uh, bazooka in so that uh, I could really kick it hard. But in the way you make movies, everything goes really fast, and we forgot to change out the bazooka. So I hit this hard steel thinking it was going to be plastic. And it hurt a lot more than plastic, unfortunately. <laughs> but it could have been worse, you know. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it was not, nothing, really. I think they made more out of it than, than it really was. But um, yeah, I have arthritis. Yeah. It happens to Bond girls, too. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, Mary, you've been in two Bond movies. Yeah. And the first one was in The Octopussy. Yes. And then you came back for A View to a Kill, which is a bigger role. Yes. Right. After Octopussy, I traveled with Roger and some other people around the world, and we did the um, advertising or, or talk shows and interviews and things all over the world. And then it was time to do to shoot of you to a kill. So they asked me if I wanted to do the beginning sequence of that. So that was perfect timing. I have just come away from traveling. And uh, we shot that, it was the, when Roger goes down on the ski, on the mountains with skis, and the, the, the people are after him, the baddies, and I come up with a submarine through the ice and save him. Yeah, the beginning sequence of A View to a Kill, that's what I mean. It's a classic scene. Yeah. Very good scene. Classic scene. So <laughs> let me ask a question, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, because we were just all talking about IMDB, and sometimes they put incorrect information. You did The Silent Lovers, where you were Greta Garbo, yeah. and surprised the crowd of the crew members during the filming, where you spoke American at one point, and they said, wait, wait, you're, you actually speak American, not Swedish, and that you had to create a Swedish accent. I did. Uh, when I um, came uh, over to try out for Garbo, they had a lot of actresses that wanted that role, and I had gotten uh, recommended by Ingmar Bergman. Uh, his wife actually said, well, you know, you should really, uh, that's a perfect role for you. And so they sent me to Ingmar Bergman's agents, Paul and Walter Kovner. And when I came in there, they said, oh, Christina, they were two brothers from Vienna that had gotten out of the, um, you know, the Second World War in the Holocaust. It was, they have history that you can't even believe. So they said, Christina, you have, you're too American, you have to, you know, so I said, give me a week and I'll see what I can do. So I watched Garbo's movies. I, I rented them from a little lab on some Gramercy place in Hollywood. I sat there and watched and saw how she spoke. And then I called Walter and Paul and I said, I'm ready to go in for the audition. So when I went into the audition, I was scared to death. But I thought, if I don't say much, I can do the scenes, but I'll just let them know I don't speak English very well. So I came in and I, they said, oh, Christina, do you understand? Yeah, I, I, I do you understand? Yeah, I, I know, I, I just do the work. So we went right into the scenes and luckily they thought that uh, I was, I was Garbo. So that was a fabulous experience for me because as a little girl growing up in Sweden, both my mom and dad loved Garbo. That was their favorite actress. And even as a 11, 12 year old, I had dressed up as Garbo for my mom and dad with the dark glasses and the hat and the, and the coat, you know, like she used to walk around in, in New York trying to be uh, unseen. So I, they took a picture of me and that was in the Swedish newspapers me being Garbo at, at 11 years old, and fast forward, you know, I was just 29 when I played Garbo, so I materialized Garbo in my life. And from there, was it that movie that got you to the Bond, or was there it, a film? It, actually, in a, in a roundabout way it was, because um, Barbara Broccoli and Albert Broccoli had seen the Garbo film, and they were impressed enough that they said, okay, uh, and then I had done a poster sitting on a Bengal tiger, which was kind of sexy in a, in a uh, cute outfit, at least I thought it was at the time. And so they said, if she looks like that, and if she can play Greta Garbo, we want her in Octopussy. So that's how I got the part. Uh -huh. And I didn't even have to test or anything. I just met them in, uh, in the office there at MGM. And I remember I always liked horses, so I came in in my dog purse riding outfit, and I said, hi, how are you? And everybody was so, it was like I found a family, you know? It was, and it has been like that for 40 years. It was like you step into warmth and love and, and a family, the Bond family, the franchise. And uh, look, at, we're still together, and we, we, we're like 
sisters, you know, with Maud and all the other girls we have. So it's great. And, and Mary, you got to be in both films. So was the second film because of the first film, and how did you get on the right. first? Right. Yeah, because well, the first film I I did a play in London uh, called Make a Break by Michael Frayn, and the Broccoli family were in the audience. And they contacted my agent and offered me to be a James Bond girl, uh, octopusy girl, through them seeing the play. And then I did that. We were on that for five months. And then I, like I said, I traveled around the world uh, doing the talk shows and all that with Roger. And then uh, one day, Cubby said, do you want to do the next uh, movie as well? So that's how it all happened. It was all very easy for me. <laughs> So then I got one question, and then we're going to turn it over to the audience. We're going to let them start throwing them out at you. I assume Bond has been legacy over the years, but what film have you done that's not Bond that you're very proud of? The one that you love when someone brings up anything but Bond. I'm sure you get a lot of that at conventions, but the one film, the one post you go, oh, thank goodness someone really has seen that film. Because Silent Lovers has not been out on DVD, to my knowledge, no. so how many people have seen that film, which is you grew a great performance. Thank you. Yeah, I think for me it would have to be the Garbo film, because it was a, almost a tour de force, um, trying to get her essence and um, being in the Hollywood for her must have been a little bit similar to the way I felt. I, I was very shy. I came from an island in the Baltic Sea off the coast of Sweden. You know, I didn't have any brothers or sisters. And I was basically afraid of people. And so, um, yeah, I, I think I really uh, got her essence. Uh, and so my, my film that I would love for people to see would be The Silent Lovers. Uh, I don't know where you can find it, but uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's also a very good film in terms of how the film industry changed from uh, the um, uh, silent film era into the talkies, and Garbo was very, very much right in the fray of that, and um, people were wondering, uh, how is this going to work? Warner Brothers were talking to, you know, uh, uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, and they said, this, this is not going to work. Talkies is just a fad. We, we don't have to go there, you know? And uh, look, look where we are now, you know? <laughs> It's amazing that they thought that talkies would be a fad. So, but uh, yeah, it's about uh, the evolution of movie making, really, the film. And then it's about the uh, love affair between Garbo and John Gilbert, who was the biggest box office movie star at the time in the 20s. So, and how she stood him up at the altar and, uh, you know, uh, about her becoming the star and about her uh, director that came with her from Sweden, who was actually the person that uh, uh, Louis B. Mayer wanted, and he kind of got Garbo as a side deal that he didn't really want, but if he wanted the, the director, he had to take Garbo, so it was about uh, personalities, and uh, I guess that's the way it was supposed to be. Garbo was supposed to be, be the biggest legend of movie movie time, so I was really uh, humbled to be able to play her her life, a slice of her life story. And your favorite film? I would say The Opponent with an Italian actor called Giuliano Gemma, uh, who is a very famous Italian actor, um, where I play this abused woman, which um, I, I like that part. That and for those who haven't seen it, explain the plot. Uh, intrigue them so they want to go seek out that film now. This weekend they got well, it's an abused woman who's a singer and her, her husband has got all kinds of weird transactions with a boxer and, and they, they try to, um, they, they try to fix the boxing game and, you know, it's all corruption and, and violence and all that good stuff. <laughs> Those are good films. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to turn it over to the audience before, because we don't want to cut to the movie too quick back there, although they're all kept in suspense. So anyone has questions, raise your hand. I'm going to grab this one, and then we'll keep going. 
Do you think there will ever be a woman James Bond? I hope not. <laughs> I don't I think it's appropriate. <laughs> I think that would be, uh, Ian Fleming had a, an, a vision of Bond, and I don't think it was wearing a skirt. No. <laughs> <laughs> So, come on, on the front, and then we'll go to the back. This is, um, what are you, what are you doing now? Um, like, if you're, if you're not working in film, is there some other endeavors or hobbies you have? It? Do you live on this continent, or you're back in Sweden, or whatever? Um, well, I, I've, I've been going back and forth a little bit, especially this year. Um, but uh, I live here more permanently now, and I live in Arizona, uh, very hot. It's been horrible this year. Uh, so uh, um, I guess I'm here for the last chapter of my life, and I stay very active. I went through cancer, and I work with the cancer survivors, and um, through doctors and uh, exercise and the Live Strong program, you know. So I, I'm very much involved in that, and um, I have a lot of friends, and I try to stay really active, and due to my health, I've had to change my eating habits for the better, uh, I hope, and um, I, I, I'm feeling really much stronger than I have in years, you know? When you go through a tough, tough deal um, with health, it, it, it makes you really appreciate life when you have health back and, and you have a little extra life. Because life is good, you know? So we have to really take it as a gift every day. So that's... And I live in Los Angeles. I am married to an Englishman. We have a 27-year-old daughter. Yeah. And... Um, I like to do gardening and potter around in the house and take care of my family. And then I've been filming a thing recently called The Pause. Um, and trying to keep busy like that. And also, I go to Sweden a lot because my mother is becoming a little older now. And um, every three months I go and see her. So I'm going next week again. Star had a... Yeah. So I'm a big Bond prop collector. I buy uh, costumes. Did either one of you sneak anything off the set, or did they did they gift you anything from the uh, from the movie that you have in your personal collection? You want to sell it? <laughs> <laughs> I still have a little octopusy tattoo. <laughs> a transfer. <laughs> the top hat or the or anything? Or? No, nothing. No, nothing. <sighs> No. Even though you knew by that point it wasn't like the early uh, Sean Connery's where you didn't know it was going to become a craze, but it has since. I don't know why I didn't keep a script or something. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what's wrong with you me? People, like sometimes producers give you something like... I know. You know I mean? Oh, we, we, we wouldn't even have had to, to ask practically because the broccolis are so generous. Yeah. But uh, at the time, you, you know, you've been wearing the same, oh my God, what am I going to do with this top hat? Right. I don't have room for that, you know? I know, was, you didn't think about no, the value of it. In retrospect, yeah. uh, I definitely wish I kept that outfit, you know? Yeah. And uh, I do have a couple of the outfits because they were mine. I have the black lace dress that uh, you saw in the backgammon scene. Yeah, yeah. That's an antique that I was given by one of the, uh, uh, well, she was actually a designer at Columbia Studios, and she was an elderly lady that I was very close to in LA when I lived there, and uh, she gave me that. So that's a super old piece, and I still have that. It's basically, you have to treat it with kid gloves. Right, right. You know, and, and another dress I think I wore there that was mine also. Uh, also in black. Oh, the one at the uh, dining room scene with Louis Jordan when he's eating the eye. Oh, yes, yes. yes. That black dress yeah. I have also. Well, then, there you go. It's something to auction off for charity in the future. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a good thought. 
if I could just find them now, but it's somewhere. <laughs> I just moved, so <laughs> everything. Somebody ends up in a bond museum somewhere. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep, right there, yep. What was it like working with Paul Adams? Fabulous. Oh, she's fabulous. She lives around the corner from me in Los Angeles. We see and her, we see her and her husband. We have dinner sometimes, and she's fabulous. We were just talking over dinner that she is very um, quiet and reserved in real life. And I was just saying to Christina, she comes from the north of Sweden, and we don't. Very different personalities, but she's super, super nice. Yeah. And you know Grant too. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Yes.